Continuing Education Committee has been trying to secure Frédéric Lavoie-Pierre as a speaker for a couple of years, but she has been traveling extensively since her retirement and has been un unavailable. Fortunately for us, the shelter in place order has curtailed her travels and we're delighted to have her as our speaker today. Frederic retired from Santa Barbara Botanic Garden where the focus is on California natives. There she served as director of education, teaching in wilderness settings, garden settings, classroom settings, but never via Zoom. She gives presentations on many aspects of sustainable gardening, including habitat gardens, beneficial insects, soil ecology, and aquatic invertebrates. Frederica gained her master's degree in biology at Sonoma State and went on to become a faculty member there. She was founding director of the Professional Certificate Program in Sustainable Landscaping and also founded and operated one of the first certified organic nurseries in California. She is a widely published author, and those of you who have been subscribers to Pacific Horticulture Magazine will no doubt recall her articles called Garden Allies. At present, she's revising those nine years of articles and compiling them into a book, which will be published shortly. Please join me in welcoming Frederic via virtual applause. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for checking in on Zoom. I'm going to talk about the art and science of conservation biological control. Um, here is one of my favorite quotes of all time. It appears in almost everything I do. Um, and um, it's just the idea that everything is connected. Um, this is a picture from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden where I worked. It's a springtime meadow and um, I hope you all have a chance to go there someday. It's a spectacular spot. So here's a little outline of what I'm going to cover here um, and um, what conservation biological control actually is and uh, why it matters, why it works. Uh, a little bit about basic bugs, although this is not about insect identification. Um, and how to put this all together. And then I will take some questions at the end. I should also mention right now that my email appears in the resources. So if you have questions um, that aren't addressed in this presentation, please feel free to email me. So what is conservation biological control? Well, this chart is adapted from um, the UC IPM. And um, integrated pest management, I'm sure as master gardeners, you're all familiar with this approach to um, pest management. But it is based on cost benefit analyses, which aren't always what we're thinking about as gardeners. Um, we are thinking about an aesthetic analysis a lot of times, what looks good in our garden. Um, <clears throat> And most of us think biological control, okay, now that is a really good environmentally uh, wonderful approach to um, pest management. But you see there are three different types here and I'm gonna tell you about what each of those is. So there's classical biological control. And in this case, we are importing and establishing an exotic natural enemy of an exotic pest species. Both of them are from another country. Um, and this handsome gentleman here, Charles Valentine Riley, was um, a founder, really, of biological pest control in this country. Uh, what happened is that at the turn of the prior century, so early 1900s, the citrus industry in California was being devastated by the cottony cushion scale, which you can see on the lower right-hand side here. It doesn't even look like an insect. And um, he asked, where does this insect come from? And it turned out Australia. So off he went to Australia and he found two different insects that were attacking cottony cushion scale and keeping it in check. And one of those was the Vidalia beetle, which is a type of lady beetle. And that's the one in this photograph. And also he found a tiny parasitic fly and he brought both of those back. Cause you could do that in those days, uh, just bring back this exotic insect. 
and they were both extremely effective. It rescued the citrus industry here in a matter of months. And both of these insects established populations and continue to control cottony cushion scale. But what we discovered is classical biological control is only uh, effective in certain situations. Basically, perennial orchards uh, is where it is best. And so in that respect, he was lucky. It can be very expensive. And the reason it can be expensive is now we know we really need to test these organisms to make sure that they are going to uh, not only be effective, but that they won't host switch. In other words, if they've eaten all the pest, what are they going to then eat next? And that's especially a concern when we talk about uh, insects that are controlling weeds, uh, where we don't want them to then switch to something that we value. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be very expensive um, to purchase an insect like that. It does offer long-term control. It has some fantastic agricultural applications. Um, augmentative biological control, we're artificially supplementing natural enemies. So these are like when you see the ladybugs at the store, and I would tell you don't buy ladybugs at the nursery, please, um, because they have been harvested from our local populations of migratory lady beetles. Um, and so they're not an ideal thing to purchase. And when you see those little net bags, and there's little black it looks like um, confetti underneath the bags. Those are ladybug legs. So um, I'm not a big fan. You can attract ladybugs by just planting the right things. So we're providing control of the pest. And it does it in two ways. Inoculation means you're releasing them at the beginning of the season and the control is by the offspring. So maybe you're releasing um, lace wings, which are one of the only insects that are really worth buying as a gardener. And the offspring, are going to establish. Inundation, you're really using it as a biopesticide, right? You're getting an immediate reduction. And the time when I think that this is especially useful is if you have, say, a large heritage oak tree and um, you're losing it because you have sap sucking insects, you might release uh, parasitoid wasps. And that might cost you 70 or $80. And so, again, not ideal for your average gardener. And this is um, what I'm interested in. Um, and we are preserving and enhancing resident natural enemies. So they're already there in your environment. And they may be um, both exotic and native. A number of good uh, parasitic insects have been introduced, um, especially aphid parasitoids. And they're everywhere now. And we love them. So uh, not all introduced insects are bad. Most of our pests that are really a problem though came from elsewhere. Cucumber beetles we often hear mentioned. They are not native. Um, and this right here is not a cucumber beetle by the way. This is a type of lady beetle. Um, so we're going to modify our environment. Two major strategies. You're going to reduce pesticides and you have to provide resources. And this is the only kind of pest control that I know of that is a positive feedback loop. So as you reduce pesticides and provide resources, you will increase your populations of beneficials. And as those populations increase, then you have fewer pest problems and um, you are less inclined to reach for pesticides of any kind, organic or not. So why it matters. Okay. Well, there is something called one planet living. Okay. And what that is referring to is the idea that we should really only be using the amount of resources that we have on this one planet to support life here. And, um, you know, this brings me to this idea of gardens. What is, what is the purpose of a garden? And I think we used to see gardens much more as it's a pretty place to hang out. And we are becoming increasingly interested in intentional landscapes, having multifunctions. They're providing for us, and certainly they should be beautiful, or we're not going to want to be in them. But they also may be providing food or herbs or medicines or fibers, um, and certainly habitat for all these other creatures that live there. Um, and for me, Ed gardens also have a strong educational purpose. It's something I have seen happen in the world of botanic gardens 
is that they increasingly see education as being one of the primary reasons they exist. So there are a lot of ecosystem, ecosystem benefits to uh, conservation biocontrol, CBC. Um, and I'm not going to read these all to you. Ultimately though, um, it leads to a long-term sustainability of our human managed landscapes if we practice uh, this type of pest control. So why it works. There was a book written long ago by one of the founders of ecology and um, it, the title of the book was The Ecological Theater and the Evolutionary Play. And it has always appealed to me. Um, George Hutchinson was his name. So I want to talk a bit about why it works. And um, you'll see I'm interested in word roots. Ecology is the study of the household, the study of living relations. It's really about theory. And um, so that is, for instance, if you were studying music, that would be the study of musicology. You don't necessarily know how to play an instrument, but you understand that this is a blues scale, for instance. Um, but it, it doesn't make you a musician. The thing that would make you the musician is the practice. So the word root there is economy, management of our household and how we're applying theory to what we're doing. So here's a word we're all familiar with, coevolution, but it's actually only been around since 1964. Um, actually, it was around a little bit before 1964. A mathematician came up with this term, and um, he has dropped into obscurity. We, I don't even remember his name. But I remember Paul Ehrlich and Peter Raven. Um, one is an entomologist, Ehrlich, and the other is a botanist, Peter Raven. They actually came up with the theory of coevolution, um, sitting at a coffee table, drinking beer, and wrote a, a paper called Butterflies and Plants, a study in coevolution, when they discovered that certain species of butterflies were related to certain species of plants in a way that they could catalog and, um, and that these things were closely linked. In the same way, plants and herbivores are closely linked, predators and parasitoids are closely linked to herbivores. And um, so this is really the foundation of what conservation biological control is based on, is this close ecological relationships um, that things have. Which brings us to specialists versus generalists. Um, now you will often find that herbivorous insects are specialists on certain groups of plants. And um, I'm sure you've seen this with like aphids. There's pea aphids and um, there's the oleander aphids on milkweed, which are only on things in the oleander family. Um, a lot of the predators um, can be more generalistic and um, parasitoids tend to be specialists. So um, we will talk more about that. Um, this is a um, female mantid ready to uh, lay her uthica. So garden allies, I'm gonna talk about insects, but I always like to point out that garden allies includes all kinds of spiders and mites and bacteria, protozoa, birds are a big one, amphibians, um, if you're lucky, like me, you have garter snakes in your yard. Um, and we will move on here. And so here is part of what makes this work. Okay. When we talk about biodiversity, it's a word that we throw around a lot, right? It was on the previous slide. Uh, but what does that really mean, biodiversity? We tend to think, when we say biodiversity, that we're really talking about richness, species richness. How many species are present in the garden? And it is true that the higher the number of plant species you have, the higher the number of arthropod species. So that's you know insects and their other relatives. But what also matters is the abundance. How many individuals of each species are present? Uh, and that is more important than richness alone. If you only have one individual of a thousand species, well, that's not going to do you much good because they wouldn't even be able to breed. Then we talk about functional biodiversity. This is a, a ladybug pupa, by the way. Um, so it's not only richness and abundance, but the identity of the species that are present that matters. 
because this brings us to a concept of insurance species. So an insurance species would be, see, okay, so you have um, aphids in your garden, we all do, and um, you have one species of lady beetles. Okay, you bought some lady beetles to deal with your aphids, but it's only one species. If you have a really beautiful, diverse garden though, you will have other species, ladybugs and other insects that also attack aphids. So that give, brings you to this concept of high functional group biodiversity. So you have a whole group of organisms that will attack aphids, for instance, or will attack, um, oh, those cabbage butterfly caterpillars. I don't like those much. Um, oops, oh, I'm sorry. I clicked, there we go, resilience, okay? So resilience is really what we're looking for in our gardens. That is the ability of your system to reorganize itself following a disturbance of some kind. And that disturbance could be a whole bunch of aphids came in. Yeah. So trophic interactions is a reference to the food web and to how things are feeding. And there's usually four levels that we think about. Autotrophs, which are plants, right, that are creating energy. They are the only thing that can create food from sunlight, actually. And then you have the first order heterotrophs. So the first order would be your herbivores. Second order is carnivores. And your third order is top carnivores. And usually when you're talking about trophic interactions or multitrophic relationships, it's only dealing with that. So it's really a simplified way of looking at it because, of course, we have decomposers and there's all kinds of other things um, going on. <clears throat> so here we are, basic bugs, arthropods, true bugs, and other insects. And I say um, true bugs and other insects because I use the term bugs a lot to mean all the creepy, crawly, flying little things. But, of course, true bugs are just one group of the insects. So this uh, wonderful chart comes from a book I love, Evolution of the Insects. If you can get your hands on it, it's full of fantastic photographs and information. And um, what this is showing you is that arthropods are the uh, biggest group of organisms on the planet. And over here somewhere are um, other animals. Okay, we're here in this tiny little yellow wedge, chordates, okay? And this is one of the reasons why I say you're not going to have a garden with no insects in it. First of all, we all love pollinators, um, but look at how many of them there are. Um, there are millions of species of insects. And now here is their chart of the insects themselves. This green section here are the whole metabolists or complete metabolism insects. And the reason that this matters to us is because they often have different ways of feeding. Butterflies are a great example, right? The caterpillars are eating your plants. The butterflies are sipping nectar. Um, and, you know, bees um, are um, pollinating, of course. And um, wasps often eat differently in, in their larval stage than they do in the adult stage, where many of them are nectar feeders in the adult stage, for instance. And um, whereas the things that have only partial metamorphosis, which includes your true bugs and your grasshoppers and your mantids, they have the same mouth parts for their whole life, and they eat um, differently oftentimes. So while one stage may be a pest, another one is completely innocuous. Um, I often ask people, you know, have you, have you seen the larvae of cucumber beetles? I haven't. Um, and so insect development, so I just talked about this a little bit. And then here is a pair of mating mantids. I actually found a pair once with the male missing his head. It was pretty gruesome. Um, so here's something else to know about insect population growth. Pests reproduce quickly. During warm weather, aphids may be reproducing every five days, and they often give live birth, but predators are slow. And so if you are changing from a garden that has you know, lawn and a couple junipers and a hydrangea, it may take a while to establish populations of predators. And that's when it often can be useful to go out and really target your pesticide use 
on specific problems. Um, I do use BT on my cabbage crops when it's not windy and I'm really careful to just do that so I can get those cabbage worms. <clears throat> and um, the predators, of course, are concentrating pesticides. I really try and avoid using them at all. So some patience is required to develop this. Now here is insect taxonomy. What kinds of groups um, do these things belong in? Typically, you look at an insect collection, what you see is all the wasps are together and the beetles are together and the flies are together. It's not extremely useful to us as gardeners because some flies are pests, some are beneficial. Same with beetles uh, and true bugs. All of these things have some things that behave as pests. So I find it more useful to think about it in terms of ecological guilds. Um, here is um, the aphid eating guild in the lower right hand side and we here have a hoverfly, lace wings, there's a parasitic wasp there um, stinging an aphid and um, there is a ladybug larva and a lacewing larva there. Um, the lacewing adult though tends to not feed on the aphids. <clears throat> Ladybugs are wonderful in every stage, we just love them. Um, and then here is a caterpillar guild on the left-hand side, wasp, and again, a lacewing larva at the bottom. Uh, generalist predators that include spiders, which are not even insects. And at the very top there is a um, pollinator guild. So your pollinator guild could include um, butterflies, bees, it could include um, lizards in some places in the world, lemurs, um, and um, bats, of course, um, we're most familiar with in terms of saguaro pollination. So these organisms may not even be related. And they also can be divided up however is convenient for us. Um, carnivores, herbivores, um, that, those are guilds. So here's the slides, always a little scary to me, herbivorous insect guild. Look at all the ways in which they eat our plants. Um, no wonder people would like to kill insects. Um, but I like to have other things do the work for me. Predators, parasites, and parasitoids. And parasitoids is a, a term we use for insects where the larva invariably kills the host. Okay? With a parasite, the host doesn't usually die. You think about some of these diseases people get. And um, if you um, if the, if it, I'm sorry, if the parasite killed its host, then it would die too. So it tends to keep the host alive. Okay, so how do we put this together? How does this work in our gardens? Well, we have to provide water, shelter, and food. I'm not going to read all of these to you again. Um, at the bottom, I'm going to point out, I once again put cultivate patience. It takes a while to establish a garden that really works for you. So we start with healthy soil. This is from a book I love, um, Life in the Soil, a guide for naturalists and gardeners. If I was going to have only one book on soil, it would be this one. And um, it is really extraordinary how much life there is in soil. When you think about it, air is like a desert, okay? and soil is covered with life. Um, and so taking care of your soil, feed your soil, and your garden is being fed. Then we want to provide water. Providing water for insects is pretty easy. Many don't need supplemental water. Um, I like the way water gathers in, the, in, in my succulents. Um, they get water from sprinklers. Those little mini sprinks are great. Um, from bird baths. The, in the lower right hand corner here are some bird baths that we had at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. I often found bees at the edge where they actually drilled a hole into this rock and put a dripper in there. So whenever they were irrigating, this would refill. And this is lotus land in the bottom left, by the way. Nothing native there, but we love it. Um, we need to provide shelter, and it's something sometimes people overlook is where are these organisms going to reproduce? Um, and um, especially, how do we shelter things from wind? If you're a small flying insect, uh, for instance, uh, hoverflies or surfeit flies are one of our best things in the garden that we can have to help us. They don't like wind, so uh, it's good to put in some wind breaks. 
then we want to make sure we're providing season long resources. So you want a nectar and pollen available for as long a season as possible. And um, floral, so floral resources are one way to do that. But there are also things like extra floral nectaries. Peaches have extra floral nectaries and you will often find um, insects accessing that. Some um, insects actually will get honeydew from aphids. So they are harvesting the sugar from the aphids. Um, and they're not always ants, wasps will do that as well. Alternate prey means we need food for those good guys uh, to stick around. And so I actually really love tucking milkweed into corners of my yard because these yellow aphids don't attack anything else. Most aphids are very host specific. And um, then, and if you look carefully at a, an infested milkweed plant, you will see that, that some of those aphids have been attacked by parasitic wasps. Um, Hummingbirds will come and eat them. Um, there'll be lace wings, surfed fly larvae, ladybugs, um, all kinds of things are feeding on those. So something <clears throat> you don't see a lot of research done on CBDC is partly because um, there is nothing to sell here. So in agriculture, um, a lot of times the research is being done on things that are going to sell products. Um, when you're doing conservation biological control, what we're saying is just plant, plant your garden right and then you don't have to worry about this. And part of the thing that really works in favor of um, CBC in gardens is that we have perennial systems where things can get established. Um, soldier beetles are a great helpful insect and they require um, a, a kind of a permanent mulch, right? They want leaf litter in which to, to reproduce. So they're not much good in annual crops. There's been no research on those uh, because they are not uh, an effective thing for people who are practicing agriculture. Um, and so uh, the amount of disturbance, sure, we have some annuals, but gardens tend to be quite perennial. This is Frog Sleep um, in Napa Valley, where they won't let you wine taste until you have had the talk about uh, conservation biological control. This is Frog Sleep as well. Uh, it's a lovely garden if you have a chance to see it. So we can create complexity in both space and time. So different species that are blooming at different times, but also layering of plants. Um, bunch grasses are really important. I see some in the background here um, as they harbor all kinds of beneficial spiders and beetles uh, that like to hide out there. So you can create a lot of niches in a garden. You have edges, you have hot spots and cool spots and spots that are moist and spots that are dry and all of those things provide homes for these different insects. Um, and again, I just want to touch on this, this idea of, you know, really encouraging biodiversity and insurance species. And the other thing that happens is if one thing gets attacked, it isn't as big of a deal if you have 30 other plants. Um, our vegetable gardens are a good example. If you're a farmer and you have one crop and it's being attacked, it's a big problem. Um, if you're me and you have um, two broccoli plants, but you have 30 other vegetables, not as big of a deal. So <clears throat> I want to talk about the right design a bit. So we can easily design our gardens to maximize these factors that have been found to increase pest regulation. And this is an area where there has been research done that applies to um, <clears throat> this method in gardens. It, most of the research has been done in agricultural systems. Um, so here's a really uh, a good example of how um, this looks like a native landscape, but it's actually the edge of somebody's garden. And um, he planted the ceanothus, he planted the salvia, and then it sort of integrates into his natural landscape. It's very beautiful. Um, and one of my favorite gardens ever, it's all native. Um, but it looks quite wild and it is not to everybody's taste. Um, this was the former demonstration garden at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. 
And um, it also had a lot of biodiversity in it and they have completely remodeled it now and um, it increased the biodiversity even further. Okay. But you can also practice this in formal gardens. So when uh, many years ago, there was an article in Pacific Horticulture and it was about lotus land. And it was about how they use this method, conservation biological control, to control their pests. And I was looking at pictures of lotus land in the article, photos like this, and I thought, that's nuts. I, I don't believe it. Um, because um, most of where I have seen this has been in gardens that are a little wilder looking. And lotus land has many formal areas. And I wrote to the guy who wrote the article, Corey, and um, said, so what, you know, what's up with this? And he said, come on down to Santa Barbara, I'll show you. And so I did, I went to Santa Barbara and he drove me around the garden. And this is what he showed me. He said, look, we have all these insectary gardens and they are over here next to the road and next to this driveway. And here is over here near the staff parking. They had two of them. And then they have one, this the oval shape here was the one where they were demonstrating beneficial uh, insect plants um, for the general public. And they did something that was kind of interesting is they would go and vacuum things up sometimes and go and release them into the garden. But um, really, this can work. So you can have a quite formal garden and just have a corner or your side yard or something where you are growing plants and providing habitat. So this, um, this is actually from when I did my master's degree. We use the word landscape in different ways. In science, the landscape, it refers to the larger uh, landscape. Um, and not to a, a backyard, for instance. And <clears throat> this guy, Charnke, did a lot of work showing how important it is that these green lines here are connecting all of these different fields together so that insects are able to move um, through different yards. So this has to do with working with your neighborhood, right, and increasing connectivity. And so when it says here, hedgerows for gardens, what we're really thinking about is shrub borders. And your shrub border does not need to be just one single species. A shrub border could have multiple species that are supporting insects. And then hopefully the insects are going to your neighbors where they also have a shrub border that is promoting biodiversity. So um, long-term sustainability is only possible if we are conserving things at a landscape scale. If you have one garden that is biodiverse in the middle of a city it is going to be really a struggle if everywhere else is uh, concrete and junipers. And I don't mean to be railing on junipers. Junipers are wonderful, um, but they can't be the only thing in the garden. So I want to talk a little bit about the right plants. So many natural enemies, okay, feed on flowers in their adult stage, and they only attack pests when they're in the larval stage. And they need nectar for energy and pollen for protein. So a lot of wasps uh, are, fall into this category, um, and a lot of the stinging wasps. So I know we worry a lot about wasps, and I do suggest to people that, you know, of course I put out the yellow jacket traps too. Most of our yellow jackets are actually exotic. Um, and if there is a paper wasp building its nest over my front door, uh, I remove it. But there are a lot of places where wasps can live and not be in our way. If, on, if they're on the backside of your garage, maybe leave them alone because they actually are very helpful. Um, they will feed on nectar and um, sometimes pollen. And then they will attack caterpillars and true bugs and they catch spiders and, um, some natural enemies, like the ladybugs we mentioned, are feeding on pests in both their adult and juvenile phases. So I use the word pests a lot. It's a really useful term. But I really, in my garden, I have come to try and think of things in terms of their ecological relationships. Um, is, it a, is it a predator? Is it a parasitoid? Is it an 
herbivorous insect because we clearly need those herbivorous insects as well. Um, and we can use some strategies about where we're placing plants that we know are prone to herbivorous insects, like the milkweed I mentioned. Um, and also to recognize that some of these things have a very short season of damage and then new leaves come out. Um, <clears throat> so this brings me to why include native plants. Okay. So, um, Oh, I see, I don't have my, my stats on here, so I'm going to wing it, so to speak. 98% um, of birds, terrestrial birds, feed their insects, I mean, excuse me, feed their babies insects. And most of those insects are herbivorous. They are almost, uh, at least half of them tend to be caterpillars. And caterpillars, if you think back to what Paul Ehrlich and Peter Raven were saying, most of those caterpillars are more or less um, dependent on certain plants and especially native plants. So native plants are important. I am a gardener though, and <clears throat> my garden is certainly not 100% native and most gardeners is not 100% native. So I try and aim for about half native plants. So I make sure that I have plants that these herbivorous insects can feed on. And I use an oak tree here. We had an oak tree uh, at the Botanic Garden. I used to start a lot of my classes there in front of the oak tree because um, I would um, ask people, what do you notice about the oak tree? We'd stand there for a while and they'd say, oh, there's a lot of birds in the oak tree. And that's right. Well, there are also 800 species of insects that rely on oak trees and they eat every part of it. The roots, they're under the bark, they eat the leaves, they're in the twigs, they eat the acorns. But really what we're noticing is the birds. And um, I think it helps people sometimes to think about that food web aspect of it and that you don't really notice a lot of these herbivorous insects. They are really good at hiding from their enemies. And so they are camouflaged or you will see that you know, caterpillars sometimes will eat only the edge of a leaf or they'll roll leaves. You, you don't always even notice them. So um, I love native plants and I hope you do too. So um, I want to mention that flowers recommended for agriculture are not always the right plants for our gardens. Um, <clears throat> first of all, a lot of the lists that we see of um, plants for beneficial insects stemmed from agricultural research. If you're a farmer and somebody says to you, hey, just stop mowing the weeds at the side of your field because they're attracting beneficial insects. Um, well, you're just a happy farmer. Um, unfortunately, a number of those plants are invasive in different places. So, uh, you know, you're not really gonna plant Queen Anne's lace on purpose, uh, perhaps. So um, it's, it's good to be aware of checking the list, oops, oh, I don't know why I just did that. Okay, check your list of recommended plants for beneficial insects against your list of invasive plants. And um, I'm always really careful about urban wildland interface. Um, if you're living in the heart of the city, it's less important. Um, you know, um, alyssum, for instance, can be invasive in a lot of places. And so I'm careful about where I plant something like that. If I live at the edge of the woodland, I have to be a bit more careful. So I'm gonna just talk about plant families. I think it's easier to think about these plants in terms of the families they're from. Um, APAC, carrot family, dill, parsley, um, have something called corn cornucopia flowers. They're very tiny flowers. They provide abundant nectar and pollen. This is an, um, Aringium. Aringium. So it looks like a thistle, but it's not. Um, and I love them. You can get those through Annie's annuals oftentimes. They are among the very best plants for attracting beneficial insects. A lot of the parasitoid wasps are incredibly tiny. You won't even notice them and they will drown in flowers with too much nectar. So these are really important plants and the best way to get them into our gardens is to um, let things like cilantro and dill and parsley go to seed. And um, I also plant cilantro repeatedly. It attracts lots of insects. So I did my master's degree on um, ornamental 
um, APAC for gardens. And it turned out after all my research that the very best plants to attract those uh, insects I wanted were flowering parsley and cilantro. Um, okay, the daisy family, Asteraceae, they have compound flowers too. And so you look at goldenrod, which does not cause um, hay fever, by the way, um, it um, attracts even very small insects. So observation is really the key to plant choice because the plants that are going to attract beneficial insects in one area may be quite different than another. And um, I, you know, I like going to botanic gardens and looking at what's flowering. And if you see flowers and a lot of insects are visiting, it's probably good for beneficial insects. Um, some of the um, flies that are really good, kind of bristly looking flies, they look like house flies, they're flower visitors. Um, so you can look there and at the nursery too, sometimes you'll see, oh, look, at, there's a lot of things visiting that. I'll plant a couple. Um, there, and I always say, look closely at a yarrow flower with a hand lens. A hand lens is one of my best tools as a gardener. Um, so the mint family is primarily bee plants, but you also attract a lot of species of beneficial flies and different sizes of flower um, affects which species are visiting. Um, and again, a lot of our common culinary herbs uh, fit into this category, thyme, oregano, rosemary, um, basil, those things are all in the mint family and are fantastic for attracting beneficials. Buckwheat family, polygonaceae um, are fantastic. We have some highly ornamental polygonaceae um, that we can use. Um, and there is the um, California buckwheat that is really commonly found. And there's also um, umbilatum, which has yellow flowers that are really pretty. And there is one with rose colored flowers that I really like a lot as well that are available um, around here. I often find those at California Flora Nursery. I also love Amarissa Nursery, by the way, most of you may be familiar with it for uh, a lot of the herbs. So the cabbage family often gets listed um, include, gets included with these plants that attract beneficial insects, but observationally, I don't find all of them to be of great value. I actually really like sweet alyssum. Um, it is a very useful plant. It's easily weeded out where you don't want it and attracts tons of um, insects. All these small flowered plants are good. Um, the buckthorn family, Ramnaceae, different species bloom over a long period. Even within the Ceanothus, you can find them uh, blooming over a long period. Um, early blooming Ceanothus, really useful. So I use the rose family here to illustrate something, which is that you can still have roses. Try and choose those with single or semi-double flowers. You're looking for something where um, nectar and pollen is easily accessible. There's a lot of suitable shrubs and trees. Uh, my native Toyon is blooming right now and it is attracting a lot of insects, especially um, honeybees, actually. Yeah, I like it. So I don't want to overlook grasses. Grasses provide a lot of early season pollen. It's really important for insects. At this particular clump here of grass, after telling people how ladybugs like to overwinter at the base of a, a clump of perennial grass like this, I actually saw in this clump the ladybugs emerging one spring. It was very cool. Of course, I did not have my camera that day. Um, it, it, perennial grass is a really important habitat, and I don't think it really matters much here whether it is native or not. Um, but look for those that are going to provide early season pollen. Another thing that provides wonderful early season pollen is um, the willow family. And willows are wind pollinated, but they still have um, nectar and um, they attract a lot of insects early in the spring. Next, wildflowers. Okay, so um, the hydrophilaceae includes nemophila, the you know, baby blue eyes, um, attracts a lot of wonderful insects. Ah, resources. So uh, I have some favorite resources. Um, <clears throat> Bringing Nature Home is a book that advocates for um, native plants. How you can sustain wildlife with native plants. Doug Tallamy, I don't know, can you see me? Here I am, there's this book. 
um, Attracting Beneficial Bugs to Your Garden by Jessica Wallister. Um, I don't have that book on my in my little stack here right now, but it is a fantastic book. And if the science of this interests you, it delves further into the science. Um, Life in the Soil, I mentioned, is a, um, has a great section on how soil, soil is made. I use a field guide to insects and spiders of North America a lot, as well as Whitney Cranshaw's book, Garden Insects of North America. My favorite book about bees, if you want to learn about bees, is this, Bees in Your Backyard. And next, I have um, several websites I use a lot. The Cornell website is fantastic. Um, you're probably familiar with the IPM website. What's that bug? If you wanna get something identified, please don't email me um, because I will get overwhelmed with that. Um, but what's that bug is a terrific place to get things um, identified. And there are some really good Facebook groups um, to identify insects as well. And, um, I have a Facebook group, Garden Allies, that I will be building up as I approach publication of my book, which won't be until next spring. And there we go, okay. So that's it. I'll put this picture back up. Okay, hello? Yes, we're here. Okay. Oh, good. I th suddenly I thought, what if I've been talking for 45 minutes and nobody's there? <laughs> I'm just frantically taking notes. <laughs> oh. Okay. Well, you will have, uh, you will have the, the recording too. And I do encourage people to, to email me. Okay. Uh, I think we only had one question on the insurance species. Okay. What are insurance species? Insurance species. So an insurance species means that, so if I was relying only on the ladybugs I bought from the store to eat my aphids, and something happens to those ladybugs, they get a disease or a predator attacks them, I don't have anything else to attack the aphids that I wanted to control. So in, in the insurance species refers to that functional group biodiversity where you might have a dozen species of things uh, that are attacking uh, the aphids that you're after. So if something happens to one or two of your beneficial species, you still have, you know, 10 others or eight others that are doing the same job. So really that's what it's referring to is, is species all doing the same job. Okay. Um, anyone else have any questions or? Uh, it was a wonderful presentation, my gosh. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Cleo, um, um, Frederick, um, uh, first of all, thank you so much. It was a tremendous uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, it was an interesting slide. I, I look at my garden, which is all drip, and I realize there's really no standing water uh, for insects. And so your slide of the rock uh, with the cutout in it uh, gave me a great idea. Because uh, as we move toward water efficiency and, and all drip, um, you know, I, I look at people's gardens and go, yeah, that's, it looks pretty dry. Yeah, I, 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 I do supply water in my garden. I, actually, I have a couple of bird baths that I refill. And often with the bird baths, you know, if you put a rock in it so that insects have a place to land so they won't drown. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I love that idea. At, that was Isabel Green. Uh, who's a landscape architect in Santa Barbara, designed those uh, rocks with the hole in them and the dripper. And it's such a fantastic way to attract beneficials. And then I have a bathtub. I actually had some dragonflies were laying eggs in my bathtub yesterday. <laughs> and so I'm gonna see if I get some dragonfly nymphs. Uh, but I do use that, uh, there's a BT Israelensis that is for mosquitoes, right? The mosquito dung. So I use that in my water features. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's interesting how, yeah, it, uh, if a garden is too dry, then that's not really wonderful for beneficials. Uh, you know, and yeah. also, uh, you know, some of the wasps use mud and some of the bees, some of the mason bees use mud for their nests. And so it's good to have a, a little bit of, 
moisture. Yeah, but I think sometimes you worry about the mosquitoes as well. Though. Right. Well, that's yeah. why I use the, yeah, I use the mosquito Which gums. BT is Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, in anything that's a permanent water feature. And then the other thing you can do um, is sometimes people have a little fountain. If the surface of the water is disturbed, mosquitoes can't lay their eggs. Oh. You know, but that only works in a small feature. How about, um, oh, am I on? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't know whether I was unmuted. Um, you know, we recommend um, using mulch, mulch, mulch everywhere and covering every square inch um, to pre preserve water. And do you recommend leaving any areas open for ground nesting bees or? Yes. I'm so glad you asked that question. So I, um, I used to teach in a sustainable landscape program, right? And um, the permaculture instructors who were there were always like, cover everything with inches and inches of mulch, right? And then I would go down to Berkeley and visit Gordon Frankie, who ha does the Urban Bee Project. And he was like, forget the mulch, you know? We need to leave everything open for, <laughs> for the ground nesting bees. And um, I thought, well, there's a happy medium somewhere there. Um, I, I do like to leave some uncovered areas. Mm -hmm. um, one of the bee scientists once said to me, though, she said, um, I said it might have been Gretchen Laboon, said, um, we know so little about what the ground nesting bees really want, you know, what kind of soil, what kind of exposure to the sun, the angle of the soil but that it is important to leave some bare spaces for them. And, um, you know, and oftentimes our paths fill that role. Um, um, but yeah, I definitely have some bare spots. I usually, when I have questions about how to do things, I do look at nature and say, you know, nature leaves bare patches of ground. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't cover everything with mulch and, you know, I often use that as my excuse to not prune. How many times have you been on a walk through the woods and thought, boy, that shrub needs to be pruned? Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and the same thing with like leaving leaf litter, I think is really important. And the more I study these insects, the more I run across this information of this insect pupates in the, in the leaf litter. Right? Soldier beetles are a good example of that. And, and how much life happens at that interface between the soil and the leaf litter. That there's an entire, is an ecotone there. Um, so you have all the things that live in the leaf litter and the things that live in the soil and then the things that live at the interface. Uh, this tends to be very biologically rich places. It's also why we like to have, um, why we like to have edges in gardens, right? And then, and, and you find these in the forest, right? You're out in nature there's the animals that live in the forest, the animals that live in the meadow, and then all the things you, at, the, at the meeting place, you get the meadow animals and the forest animals, and then certain animals that want to be right there at the interface. Uh, and the same is true with uh, any ecosystem, really. And, and in the same vein, I know that um, building insect houses, insect hotels has become very trendy. I think you can even buy them at Home Depot now. Um, mm -hmm. How is that really necessary? Or if we leave a kind of a messy area in the garden, will that take the place of being you constructed? Know, you don't have to construct an insect mm -hmm. hotel at all. And many of them are not made properly. <laughs> Actually, if you Googled, um, if you Googled my name and in insect hotels and in Pacific Horticulture Magazine, an article will come up about insect hotels. And there's a web supplement with that. And what book do I use? I use the Xerces Society uh, Farming with Pollinators book, which has all the recommendations for preventing disease and um, the size of the holes and mm -hmm. how, how deep the straws need to be. There's a lot of terrible insect hotels that don't work. Um, all that said, I think in your average garden, there's no need, you know, um, sometimes if you're cutting something like elderberries that are hollow, or I like to use um, fennel because it's so readily available. Mm -hmm. 
um, I just go cut it by the roadside and you just cut some bundles and put them in a corner somewhere. My main thing is that they are great for education. Um, I had one at Sonoma State. I think it's still there, actually. And there was a little bench. So you could sit on the bench and you could watch the bees and it, wasps also coming back and forth. Um, so educationally, they're fun, but they're really not necessary. Hmm. Um, they, uh, a little backstory is that insect hotels were invented by the Germans. Um, the Germans have very neat forests. Uh, they were very organized, right? Everything, everything's in rows and raked up. And they started to notice a lack of predatory wasps. And so they originally built insect hotels for wasps um, to attract the wasps. And, and, and I, th I think it's funny that they didn't think maybe we should just leave the forest a little more disorganized. Mm -hmm. No, instead they built specific hotels for the wasps. And uh, um, and so it, that surprises people sometimes. They put in an insect hotel and they get wasps too, solitary wasps. It's good. Um, but they, they need, they need nothing has um, inhabited my insect hotel at all. <laughs> it's just... um, sometimes it needs to, so they need to get morning light oftentimes. You need to look at the Xerxes book. It's got a big chapter on... Um, how to do it. And I will tell you, the one we put in at Sonoma State had nothing the first year. And we thought, well, maybe it's because we're so close to the creek. And so um, there's, there's just no need for a hotel. But then the second year, a whole bunch of things moved in. So, um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I think we, we're done with the questions. Do you want to close, David or Anne? Or... Thank you very much for, the, <laughs> for agreeing to do that. Yeah, thank, thank you for, uh, for making the se second attempt. Yeah. Well, thank you for your patience. And um, I, it was my pleasure to do this. I, I love doing education, and I am missing it right now. Thank you. And I just add my thanks again for yeah all the, the time and effort and I know it's been you know 